there's never a boast or a brag. All righty then, let's do this thing. <laughs> Everybody, this is Big Anklevich here with another episode of the Ankle Cast. Um, this episode is kind of a by request episode. A Monsieur Rich Outfield uh, sent in a request to the show uh, asking to hear about the experience, what it is like. Uh, I guess just to be old. Uh, <laughs> Or maybe that's not exactly what he was after. He, he wanted to know what, uh, what I thought, what I felt, what my reaction was to having my oldest son move off and go to college. Uh, that just happened a few weeks ago. And it was, uh, it was an interesting experience. Um, and yes, there is a little bit about being old involved in that. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really weird to me that I'm old enough that um, I have a son that's 18 years old and can go off to college. Basically, he's off living on his own now. He's, he's moved away from my house and he's trying to be in charge of himself. He's, uh, he's looking for a job. He doesn't even live in the same state. Luckily for me, he lives back where we used to live. Um, so I have some family around there that can uh, help keep an eye on him. But um, yeah, it's, it's strange. Uh, I, knew, I knew that it was coming. I knew that he wasn't gonna hang around um, because he didn't like it here in Texas. He really didn't want to have come. He misses his, well, sorry, he missed his friends a lot. He spent most of his time uh, just playing video games with them online. Uh, you know, he'd just sit in front of his computer and be shouting into his little headset that he had on, just blah, 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 you know, at all hours, and it would get frustrating. Of course, he did that before we moved, too. Um, so I suppose it's not that big of a, a change, but now he was doing it with people that lived a thousand miles away instead of people that lived uh, across, the, uh, across town. Um, so... Yeah, now he's gone. Um, it was interesting leading up to the day, uh, just by chance, um, I was listening to an old country song. I happened to put on, I, I guess I was trying to fit in here in Houston, you know? Uh, I, I grew up with a brother who really liked country music. Um, and because of that, I kind of rebelled against it. I refused to like country music. I didn't want to. And uh, despite that, you know, you hear something enough, you're going to find stuff that you like about it. Uh, you hear some kind of music a bunch of times, and there's going to be songs that appeal to you, even though you don't admit it uh, to begin with. Eventually, you're going to look back and be like, oh, yeah, I remember that Alabama song. That song was good. And uh, I'm that way now. I realize that I, I like old country songs. And, and since I live in deep in the heart of Texas, I figured that I ought to, uh, you know, give it a shot. Maybe, I, I mean, here I am in the center of all that is country music. I ought to uh, try listening to some. So I was, I was at work. And I put on a YouTube playlist 
of classic country songs. Basically, the country songs that I remember from when I was younger and I was forced to listen to country music while sitting next to my brother's car as he was underneath it, working on it, and then asking me for tools to be handed in to him. Uh, I wasted a lot of my youth doing that because my brother was bigger and stronger and meaner than I was and he would force me to do that and sometimes I would slip away and then he would track me down and drag me back and make me sit there again while uh, he was under the car doing his thing and then he would ask me for tools and I would have to hand them in to him and, and the whole time there was a boom box up on the uh, table in the garage playing country 105 FM um, so yeah I was listening to uh, a playlist of those kind of country songs and out of the blue a song by Conway Twitty came on now I know very little about Conway Twitty apparently he died in uh, like the late 80s or the early 90s, somewhere around there. And so I didn't hear a lot of his music. He's much more of like a 60s and a 70s and maybe an early 80s kind of a guy. But apparently he came out with an album right around the time that uh, I was stuck listening to country music all the time. And um, it included a song called That's My Job. Um... And I remember even my own dad mentioning this song once back when, I don't know, one of us kids needed help from him. And, and he referred to, he's like, yeah, it's like that, that country song, you know, that's my job, that's what I do. I hadn't heard that song probably since the 1980s. And um, this song came on while I was sitting there at work, you know, doing other stuff editing video, stuff like that. This song comes on, and it started playing, and it was it was kind of a weird situation for me. Uh, and, I, and I've probably mentioned it on the show before, that I, I am easily emotional. Uh, I cry at movies a lot. My wife thinks it's funny. Uh, when there's emotional moments, she'll look at me instead of looking at the movie so that she can see me cry and then point it out or point and laugh and say, you're not a real man or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm easily emotional, uh, I guess. Um, most people would just get emotional but wouldn't be moved to tears. I get moved to tears really, uh, rather simply. And so this song came on and I can't play it obviously, because if I do, then uh, my video will like not be allowed to be shown or some crap like that on YouTube. Cause I'm sure somebody has the, uh, copyright to it and they won't allow it. Um, I thought about trying to sing it. Maybe I still will. Maybe right now I'm going to cut to myself singing the song at home and you can hear a little bit of what it's like uh, but if not I'll just try and read the or, or, or recite the lyrics to you but anyways the song comes on and uh, it starts with with the words I, I want to say it goes I woke up crying one uh, late one night when I was very young I had dreamed my father had passed away and gone. My life revolved around him. Uh, now I can't remember the words. But basically he's saying he's really upset by this dream, right? And he says he goes out into the hallway. He goes to uh, call out to his dad because of his dream. He can't not go and make sure that his dad is still there and that he's okay. And he says, Daddy, I'm so afraid. How can I go on? 
with you gone this way, uh, I can't remember exactly the words again, but then he says, can I come and, and lay with you and, you know, basically be comforted? And then the chorus of the song comes in and he says, that's my job. My, my dad said, that's my job. That's what I do. Everything I do is because of you, to keep you safe with me. That's my job, you see. And it's funny, because I, I complain about country songs a lot, because they have a tendency to be, uh, what's the best way to say it? I don't know, like Hallmark Hall of Fame-esque. Uh, you know, the worst Christmas song in the world is that damn Christmas Shoes, which is a country song that's based on Hallmark Hall of Fame movie. And it's such BS, you know, it's just meant to, it's purposefully made to pull at your heartstrings and it fails miserably, but uh, that's what it's there for. And a lot of country songs are like that. They're just, they're, they're formulaic and almost, uh, you know, just bald-faced in there. Yeah, that's what what I'm here for. I'm here to try and make you cry. I'm here to try and drum up emotion for a subject that uh, is important to you. Uh, but I guess I don't know. Maybe it's not just country. Maybe all all music is that way. Um, you know, pop music that makes you think of your first love or whatever. Or you know the the rap song that makes you remember the first uh, the first chump the first pimp that you murdered uh, you know th that kind of stuff it really uh, it really you know gets in at the core uh, of you and makes you makes you feel the emotion but yeah this song did exactly that uh, the weird thing is at the same time as having a son who's 18 years old and about to move away, I have another son who's six years old and he's just starting his life out. And on top of that, this six-year-old son could be a carbon copy. He could be a clone of my 18-year-old. They look so similar, you know. My, my 18-year-old looked almost exactly like my six-year-old when he was six. And so it's almost like I have both ends of the spectrum at once. I have the version of my son that was six that would have a bad dream, that would come to my room, that would cry and say, Daddy, I'm afraid. Can I come and sleep with you? And then I have the other end of the spectrum, which is verse two of this song, That's My Job, which is about when the sun grows old. And by the way, the sun, obviously, I, I, I'm sure this comes through uh, with the lyrics that I told you, but the sun is the uh, point of view character in the song. And the sun, uh, is now 18 and he wants to move off and go to Hollywood and become a rock and roll star. I, I, I'm sure it's kind of autobiographical for Conway Twitty, although I think it was not written by him. I think it was written by someone else. But, um, yeah, he, you know, he's, he's got to venture out on his own. He's, he's grown up. And it's time for him to go off and be a man, to be his own person. And uh, the, the song's chorus comes in again, and he says, Daddy, I'm so afraid. Because there's no guarantee in these plans that I've made. <laughs> oh, I'm such a dork for crying about this, but can't help it. I'm sorry that I, I know that was Rish's point. 
is to see if he could elicit tears out of me and make me talk about this. He says, Daddy, I'm so afraid. There's no guarantee in these plans I made. You know, what if I go out there and fail? You know, what, what, what do I do then? And basically the dad says, that's my job, that's what I do. You know, I, I can pay your fare back home. Give you a soft landing, basically, is what he's, uh, what he's promising him. You know, I'm, I'm, I'll be here for you if you need me. And so here I am listening <laughs> to this song at work. And I, like I'm doing now, I, I friggin' started bawling. I couldn't, way worse, I guess, than I'm doing now. I started bawling. And I'm like trying to wipe my eyes. And then the song, you know, the chorus would come into my head again and I would, I'd tear up again. I'm just like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't make myself stop crying. It's just the, the, the twin things of my two sons, the one who's little and needs me because he's, he's afraid and he's, he's got to be protected by his dad. And then the, the older one who's about to go off on his own and he's afraid because he's always had my protection and now he's going to have to put it on the line for himself and I couldn't stop crying. It was the worst. And I kept, uh, I kept having to like get up and go to the bathroom and like totally wipe my eyes and then I'd go back and sit down and the song would come to my head again and it would make me cry again and I was just like, damn it, I got to play something else. I got to get some other song stuck in my head so that I can stop this before people are like, what is wrong, big? Why are, are you, why are you crying? What is going on? And, uh, yeah, eventually I managed to, uh, you know, I, I listened to the Macarena over and over again and pretty soon and that, you know, that was what was stuck in my head. So... I just listened to Gangnam Style on repeat, and then pretty soon I was just going, whoop, 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 a Gangnam Style. So, you know, it, it all turned out okay. Nobody, I, I don't know. I don't know if anybody noticed. I mean, nobody notices me there anyways. I'm just that peon guy, that the, the new guy. It's weird, because I've been there a whole year. I'm still just the new guy that nobody cares about, I would say. At least that's how it feels. But anyways, uh, yeah, it's tough. Uh, we did a lot of things together the last month that he was here. I, I kind of really wanted to make memories. Uh, so we went camping. We went to the beach. We went out for like day trips. Uh, I took him to San Antonio. And we went and saw the Alamo because I was like, come on, man, you lived in Texas. You got to see the Alamo, right? I mean, the Alamo is the, the symbol of Texas. Um, so we did a bunch of stuff like that. We went to the Riverwalk, which, uh, man, that place was cool. It's weird because the Alamo is right there. You go down a set of stairs and it feels like you walk down into freaking Venice. You, it does not feel like the United States of America, you know? The, the river is winding right through the town and there's a sidewalk going along either side of it and there's all these little sidewalk cafes. Uh, the river walk was very cool. Um, and I had no idea, I'd never ever heard of it in my life. Um, I never would have considered San Antonio to be a tourist type town. But I guess it's probably the most touristy of all the towns in, uh, in Texas. It's got, you know, several uh, amusement parks. It's got, like, SeaWorld, and it's got, like, Six Flags, and it's, and it's got, like, some, some water parks, and it's got the Alamo, and it's got the Riverwalk, and it's, I don't know, it's a lot of stuff that I had no idea about. I guess maybe for the folks that live around here, it's a big deal, and they all go there all the time that kind of stuff but you know you move further west or east and people are like no we're going uh, I don't know. our tourist town is Myrtle Beach um, our tourist town is Santa Barbara uh, oh, Santa Cruz whatever I don't know anyways 
Um, yeah, we did a lot of stuff like that, went to all these places, and I tried to talk to him and impart that last bit of knowledge, the last bit of, uh, I don't know, the last bit of being a parent. Because, yeah, he's now off and he's on his own and he's in charge of himself. And my, my job, I guess, is mostly over. I mean, I guess I can still advise him here and there when he calls. Uh, but it was my last chance to kind of do that. And it's also kind of, I mean, at this point, you know, when your kids are growing up, you can't be their friend, you know what I mean? You have to be their parent. And I think that's some of what the problem is with, uh, with our world is that a lot of people want to be friends with their children um, over and above being their parent. You know, they'll be, they'll, they'd rather be nice to them than stern and uh, that kind of stuff. But if you want them to grow up and be functional people, you've got, you've got to teach them. You've got to be stern sometimes. You've got to not be their friend. But at a certain point, that changes. You know, your child is going on and they're going to have their own life. And at this point now, it's, yeah, you're still their parent, but now you can also be their friend. You can have uh, similar interests and you can share that kind of stuff and, and whatever. And I think me and my son have a lot of that kind of stuff. I think, uh, sadly, I imparted a lot of my nerd, uh, my nerdiness onto him. He likes video games much more than, you know, like TV and stuff, but he loves, you know, Marvel and he loves Transformers and he loves Star Wars and all that kind of stuff, the same kind of stuff that I'm into. And uh, yeah, there came finally that day that was his last day. And uh, there's another country song. Maybe I'll sing it at home as well and insert it, or maybe I'll just try and tell you it, but it's a song by, ooh, I can't remember the name of the guy. It's basically about this guy who impregnates a woman by accident. And he's like, oh crap, I had all these plans that I was gonna do for my life and all those plans are gone. And uh, I think the song is called, There Goes My Life. And he's so upset that he's just blown it all. And again, it's one of those songs that's uh, made to, to get you to feel a certain way. And then the baby comes along and he realizes that, that, that he loves that baby. And the baby becomes his life. And he's, you know, he, the verse two, the middle verse is, him, you know, talking, talking about how every little uh, crappy drawing that the kid makes goes up on the refrigerator, and oh man, he just loves that little girl. And uh, then the last verse is when that little girl is grown up and she's heading off to the West Coast to go to college, and. Uh, she gets into the car and drives away, and he says, there goes my life. There goes my future, my everything. I love you. Baby, goodbye. And uh, that song <laughs> now came to mind, and it was playing in my head that day instead as uh, I had to load up the car. They tried loading it up beforehand and <laughs> my wife insisted on getting these big plastic totes, you know, those great big things that always go on sale like right after Christmas where they're like, yeah, put away all your Christmas decorations. You're gonna need more of these for that. And so they're always on sale. But yeah, she bought us uh, several of those up for him to take with him. And of course, you know, they're rigid and they, they don't fit 
in a little car very well. They take up a lot of space, but and they, and they don't fill the space, you know. So we had to dump all of his clothes and stuff out of those things and stuff them in to the uh, the cracks and crevices among all the other stuff. And so yeah, I stuffed it all full and just filled in all the spaces. And we managed to get all of his crap in the car so we could take it with him. And uh, my wife and my daughter and my 18-year-old son got in the car. My wife and daughter were, were going with him to drive him uh, to drive him to school, to drive him to his new apartment. And then they were going to fly back. And I stayed home with the other two kids while they were gone. And... Um, yeah, they all got loaded up. And I gave my son a hug. Which is was funny, because, you know, ever since... I don't know. Probably younger than 12 years old. He's been a non-hugger. He's not a physical affection kind of a kid. And I'm, I know that most boys are that way. Uh, a lot of them will still hug their moms or hug their sisters or whatever, but hugging your dad, hugging another man is always kind of weird for a boy. Uh, and yet, uh, and so, yeah, when I went to hug him, he, he, he I think, thought it was a weird, but, he, you know, he did it. He's gigantic now, and it's hard to, <laughs> to hug this kid. He's, he's freaking enormous. He used to be just this little, little thing. And now he's this huge mongo. Um, I don't know if you guys uh, remember that guy from, uh, what was it, Heathcliff, I think? There was a Heathcliff cartoon from back in the day, and there was a big old cat. And he would say, my name is Mungo. I would call my son Mungo a lot because of that. Although I don't know if he had any idea what I was talking about. He probably just assumed I was shortening down the word humongous. But, uh... But, yeah. I gave him a hug. Uh, awkwardly. And then, uh, yeah, he got in the car and drove away. So far, that's the last I've seen of him. Uh, we, we have a day set up for, uh, I mean, most Sundays, as long as he doesn't have other plans, we get together. Uh, he's got, what is it, Discord or whatever, the gamers... Uh, do their thing on and uh, him and my daughter both have discord so he'll uh, he'll get on and we'll do a little video chat we have chat with by video phone which it's funny for some reason that still just amazes me it feels like I live in the future because of of because uh, I have a video phone I mean it's a computer but it's a video phone um, so so we still do that most weekends. Uh, he's still struggling to find himself a job, st struggling to get his feet underneath him and really, uh, he hasn't actually started school yet. He's going there and he's gonna get himself a job and he's going to uh, try and earn some money so that he can pay for school. Um, So yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll have to see how it goes. Possible that he might be back living with me again. Although I know he doesn't want to. He doesn't like it here, and he doesn't want to be back. He wants to be where his friends are. Um, eventually he'll learn. Your friends from high school don't last. They'll always, you know, kind of be your friends, but eventually everybody gets their own life and they move on, and. Uh, sure that'll happen to him too and then uh, maybe he'll be better than me 
I'm, I'm the worst with my family. I don't call my dad very often. I should. I mean, my dad's 81 years old now. How much longer will I have my dad? I should really call him and talk to him more often. I don't. I'm terrible. I don't, I'm not good with anybody in a long distance uh, kind of a relationship. I don't talk with Rich, Rich, Rish as much as I should. Uh, other friends that I have from, from back there, I don't talk with as much as I should. My family. I love seeing my family. I love hanging out with them, but I don't call them and hang out with them and do that kind of stuff. We just don't have that kind of a relationship, I guess. I don't know. Hopefully uh, I can develop something like that with, uh, with my son eventually. I think for now he's, he's young and he wants to do the young person thing. He wants to be in college and he wants to hang out with his friends and I don't know, get himself a girlfriend or whatever. I don't know if that's, that's in his plans. Who knows? But, uh, oh, no, my phone is ringing. Let me see, uh, see what it is. It's, oh, it's Rish Outfield. Hello, Rish Outfield. Hey, Big, this is Rish Outfield, formerly your partner over on the Doonstief Audio Fiction magazine. Now I've got my own show, The Rish Outcast. Oh, and I recently sold an animated show to Adult Swim called Devils in the Outfield. Oh, really? It's really just a sports parody, but with much, much more blasphemy. It's about a group of demons that get a team to... No, wait. That was a dream. Huh. Anyhow, I got some questions for you. Okay. For this episode. I really wanted you to do an episode about this because uh, I have no life of my own. So, your son has gone off to college. Yeah. I, I envy him, I think. I'm not sure if I'm remembering it right, but college might have been the last time that I was truly happy. No, nope, that, that was probably elementary school I'm thinking of. Okay. No. Yeah, that's probably true. Question number one. All right. When I think of your son, for some reason, I think of him the way he was when I first met him. A tiny blonde elf with a pointed hat and pointed ears. <laughs> Not the giant teenage Solomon Grundy he became and appears in photos and when I last saw him. Uh, when you think of your son, how do you picture him? You know, that's interesting because I, I, I guess I, I still see him as both. I, I talked about that a little earlier. Uh, because I have the little uh, mini-me of him living in my house at the same time, I often will think of that that one. I'm, I'm really a sucker for uh, like family memories and stuff like that. I made uh, a thing out of uh, you know saving all of um, our home videos and stuff like that and I'll, I'll watch them relatively often. Uh, my hard drive crashed last year and I lost all the captures that I'd made of all those old videos and I was trying to recapture them recently. And so I threw on the very first home video we did. And this was when my son was one and a half, maybe, tops. One, yeah, I think one and a half years old. And uh, <laughs> it's another one of those things. Watching it just brought tears to my eyes. Was, this is the kid. This is back when he was that, you know, one that says, Daddy, I'm so afraid. I just, uh, just want to be with you so that I can feel better. And I found myself tearing up again watching these little videos of of him and I on the on the floor in the living room wrestling and playing and him riding on my back like I was a horsey and all of that kind of stuff and um, special stuff I think of him a lot of that but he's been here all along 
And so I also have kind of forgotten what he was like. You know, without those videos, I wouldn't... It, it goes away. I remember once seeing a comedian who was talking about, uh, you know, he was at some tourist place and everybody was there with their video camera stuck to their face or their phone up or whatever, videotaping, and they're just like, and he was pissed off at these people. He's just like, man, you, you idiots, why don't you experience this while you're here? Uh, you know, nobody, you're never gonna watch this crap later. Nobody, or actually I think what he was saying is nobody else is ever going to watch this. So you don't need to record this for them. And I was just like, dude, you don't get it, man. It's not for somebody else. It's for yourself. You're going to remember it and you're going to, but you're not going to remember it well. I can't remember what my kids were like back then very well without the videos and so forth to keep it fresh. Um... Without that, it would be gone. And uh, I don't know if that answers your question at all, but I, I kind of see him, I guess, as both because I have the new version of him and then I have the mini-me little version of him and I remember both, but mostly the new version of him because he, that's what I see every day. It's funny because, you know, if somebody, for example, is fat and then they lose a bunch of weight, but there's somebody you see every day Sometimes it's hard to even notice that they've lost weight because it's so gradual that you don't even think about it, you know? They're always that same person that you've always saw and you don't even realize that they've changed. And it's that way with my son, you know? He, he started out little and very gradually became Solomon Grundy. And so, you know, you don't, you don't think of him as that little guy anymore. Whereas for you, who saw him and then didn't see him for a year, and then you saw him again, and then you didn't see him for two years, and, you know, you only get, you dip in and out, and so you get flash frames of what he's like, basically. And um, I think that's the difference. I don't know. Question number two. Oh, okay. I hate it when parents pretend they love all their children the same. When everybody has a favorite, even you. I mean, among your children, I'd say Sonoma is my favorite. Which is yours? Okay, that's a loaded question, but the funny thing is you're probably gonna hate my answer because I don't know that I could say that I have a favorite. Do I have a favorite? Do I love one of my children more than the others? I don't think so. I love them, they're, they're all different. You know what I mean? They all have things that are good about them and things that are bad about them. And, you know, maybe I'll have, maybe one of them will become one of those monsters that is so awful uh, that I can't stand to be around them. And then I can be like, okay, well, that one's not my favorite. Um, but each, each of my kids has qualities about them that I really love, I really admire. Like, you know, Sonoma does great things. <laughs> Sonoma. Um, and, you know, my oldest son does things that are great, and he does things that frustrate me. And my youngest son is great in some ways and frustrates me in other ways. And my other daughter, who's, you know, she has things that are great about her and things that are frustrating. And, and we uh, have issues and the other things that make me love them. And yeah, do I love them all even? I don't know. If it's not even, it's close. Um, I don't know, it's, it's different than having friends. You know what I mean? You can easily say this person is my best friend because it's the person that you want to spend your time with and you have that choice, you know what I mean? You can just say, nah, I don't want to hang out with that guy, he's a douche. Or he's more of a douche than I'm willing to deal with right now. And, but you don't get to do that with your kids. You have to deal with them. Uh, they're, you're, they're, uh, you know, they're, 
trying to think of the right word for it. I was going to say you're their master, but that's not the right word. Uh, you know, you're in charge of them. You are They are your responsibility. You can't just be like, eh, you're not my favorite. F off. Um, you know, you always have to deal with them and help them out and, you know, nurture them along and, and all of that kind of stuff. And when you're doing that with somebody, you're going to... You're going to love them both. And I, you know, I'm sure you understand. I know you have several nephews, for example. And maybe you have one that you would say you like better than the other, but I, I'm almost willing to guarantee that it's a really tight race. And you would just be like, nah, you know, I, I love them both. And I, I really want them both to succeed and to be happy and, and etc. And now you've got, I think, a third, like a little baby. So, you know, there's going to be more competition. Plus, you've got an older niece. I don't know, you've got all sorts of stuff going on. All these kids you have to choose between. But you know what? You don't have to. That's not, uh, not really part of the deal, you know? You can just love them all and help them all. Some might require more effort than others. Um, but they all deserve some effort. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Sorry if I disappointed you. Question number three. Okay. The last time we were together, you complained about the dopey, shiftless sack of potatoes your child had become. Did that change as your time was getting short? Or did it change only in your mind? I don't know if I would say that I called him a dopey, shiftless sack of potatoes. Um, he did get his own interests and pursue those interests. And unfortunately for me, a lot of those interests weren't my interests. You know, I don't, I'm not so into computers. I'm definitely not that into video games. Uh, even when I was younger and other, and, and being into video games was cool and all my friends wanted to be into video games, I didn't get that into them because just, I don't know. I, I think it was mostly because I was never any good at them. That, and I never had the good stuff at home so that I could practice and become good at them. But yeah, he made his own computer and played his video games at home all the time and played with his friends. And I understood him, you know what I mean? You say he was a dopey, shiftless sack of potatoes. It wasn't really that. I, I understood his interests and I remember when I was like that I had interests that possibly weren't in my best interest there were things that I wanted to do that weren't gonna get me good grades uh, or you know or something like that and I think my wife had a harder time with it I don't know that she understood it as much but I remember when there were video games or other things that I would just become completely addicted to. Because uh, I, I had my share and <laughs> I was, at one point I was addicted to this freaking game. It was just one of those text games, like what is it, the Oregon Trail or whatever, where it's like, you have died of dysentery. It wasn't that game, but games like that, because that was, that's what passed for computer games in some circles when I was a child. Uh, there was a game called Trade Wars that you could play uh, on bulletin board systems, a BBS. You would call it up with your modem. You'd actually dial a phone number and connect computer to computer. And I would get on and play these little text-based games. And the one that I liked the most was Trade Wars, which was a space trader slash war game where you were, you know, a guy who would travel around the known universe and trade equipment ore and organics with the various space stations while building up your fighters and uh, getting more cargo holds and all that kind of crap until you could become the greatest and had rankings of who was number one and I played that so much I was so addicted I remember one time when something was wrong with my computer or something like that and I actually called my friend and had him uh, 
call with his modem and do my turn. I told him my password and he would do my turn and I sat there on the phone. Okay, now go to this sector. Okay, yeah, what are the, what are the prices on their stuff? <laughs> I think about that and I think that's a little crazy, but I, th- I think I turned out okay. Uh, I was super addicted to this game, but I turned out okay, and so I don't, I don't see that as such a bad thing. I was, I was a lazy, shiftless sack of potatoes, um, and sometimes my son uh, acted a lot more that way at home, I think, than when he was, uh, you know, at his at his own job, and so. I think that was uh, w- was kind of what uh, made us a little more frustrated a little, is that we saw probably the worst and other people got to see the best. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, I-, I-, I think that he's going to be just fine. I don't think he is uh, that kind of a kid. Um, you know, when you're at home, you want to let your hair down, you want to be yourself, you want to do what you want to do. Uh, and you don't want to always be doing chores and always be pitching in and, you know, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about because I'm sure you were a lazy, shiftless sack of potatoes as often as possible when you were a teenager as well. So, you know. Question number four, along those same lines, You spoke of spending your last weekends with the boy, doing activities and traveling together. Now, how did knowing he was going away affect the time you were together and your attitude there at the end? I talked a little bit about about that already. It was kind of my last chance, you know. I, I was able to spend a little bit of time with him and impart that last bit of parenting, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I did my best. Uh, It was a little weird. I felt, I guess you could say I was compelled to, you know, I got to talk to him. Even though we were, you know, we're driving for two hours to San Antonio and I'm just like trying to find a way to uh, keep things interesting the whole way. But yeah, I don't know. I think I talked enough about that. I'm, I'm, I'm leaving it at that. You want to know the answer? Listen to the earlier part of the show, huh? Question number five. Does having a college-aged son, when you never matured beyond the college age yourself, make you feel old? Just asking. I guess I already talked about that too. Yeah, yeah, I felt old. Uh, it, it does make me feel old. Um... It's weird, I can't believe that I'm, I'm old enough to have something like that, because I don't feel like that. Like you said, I'm, I'm, I'm barely, I'm, I never progressed past being a kid myself. I mean, you see my study filled with toys. I still have toys on the shelf, and I know so many people will talk about how shiftless and worthless the younger generations are these days, because we never really grew up. We're still mired in things like, you know, we still love our Transformers and crap like that. And our pop culture has taken the place of, I don't know, growing up and becoming an adult. And yeah, I, I, I don't feel like I'm old enough for that, but obviously I am. Soon I will be dead. Thanks for reminding me. Number six. I wonder if losing your son to college is, eh, as twisted as this sounds, at all similar to me losing my father to death a year ago, or to you, losing your mother to cancer. Is it a totally absurd comparison? I don't think it's an absurd comparison. It's, it's a little similar. I mean, it could almost be exactly the same. Uh, I mean, obviously he's out there and, and continuing on, but depending on whether I see him or not, uh, you know, there are people that were in my life uh, and that were big, very important parts of my life, and then our lives went in different directions. And as far as I'm concerned, not as far as I'm concerned, but 
I'm, they might as well be dead because I'll never see them again. Uh, I'll never, they'll never be a part of my life again. And it, I think it is kind of similar. And, it, and I think that's one of the main reasons why it's so sad to say goodbye to people because a lot of times you never know. And yeah, I remember once going out with a girl back in, uh, in college and I was, it was actually, I was at a community college and I was about to head off to a real college and I was not, this girl wasn't coming along with me and it was basically, that was it. I was saying goodbye and, and she was not happy with that and was kind of doing passive aggressive stuff about that and she talks to her sister saying man while i'm sitting right there next to her yeah sometimes it's just so weird how somebody can be such an important part of your life one year and then you know the next year they're gone they're nothing they're they they've completely disappeared and yeah i mean that's I mean, my son was an important part of my life like that for 18 years and now he's gone and at the very least i mean this was this was the whole point of it he was supposed to grow up and supposed to go off on his own he wasn't supposed to be a child forever uh i would not be happy if i was still stuck at my dad's house living there for my entire life forever 40 four-year-old person, you know, still living with his dad, never having progressed beyond, uh, beyond that and gone off to have my own life and stuff, I wouldn't be happy. And, you know, that's, that's what we're all, that's why we have kids is so that we can bring them up to become adults. And so, you know, maybe it is a little death. Uh, but he's not dead. He's, he's still alive. He's not gone forever. I can see what he does from here. I can mourn with him when he has defeats. I can celebrate his uh, victories when he has them. I can possibly go to his wedding, meet his wife, someday have a child that he fathered, you know, that I can hold in my arms and say, wow, this is my grandchild. This is amazing you know i mean there's there's that so it's not quite the same but it's not i don't think it's an absurd comparison because it, it's it's tough it's really tough to to let him go it's really hard question number seven i may have told you this story before about a lady at the writers conference i went to who was she was speaking about using what little free time a person has in the most productive way possible, uh, writing-wise. Uh, she told the tale that she had been a serious would-be writer uh, when she was young and when, for, when she first got married. But as she started having children, well, as she transitioned from full-time writer to uh, part-time writer to full-time mother. And once she had more than one kid, she stopped writing altogether as she would complain to her husband how frustrated she was not to have the time to write anymore and how she could only write when the children were napping. And then she started to resent them when they woke up because it meant she had to put her dreams of writing back on hold. How she longed for the days when the kids would go off to school and she would be at home with hours to be a writer once again. Now, she told her husband this over and over, that one day, when the kids were gone to school, she would finally fulfill her destiny. One by one, the kids got older, and she took them off to school, and then took the younger ones home, feeling anxious for the days when all of them would be at school, and she would feel complete once again. No more would she have to write for five minutes at a time or 10 minutes if she was lucky, wishing her free time would last just a little bit longer. Finally, the day came when her youngest was old enough to start school. She was so excited the day before classes began 
that she actually touched her husband in the way she knew he needed to be touched. And he too felt that a world of possibility lay ahead. Now she drove all her children to school, her mind turning over the great writing she would get done as soon as she got home. She dropped them off, one by one, wishing them well and watching them go off to elementary school. Then, alone in the car, she began to weep, for now they were gone, and what was she to do with herself? All her plans had been so stupid, so selfish, and for six hours she wrote not at all, only crying and wishing that she were dead. You know, actually, that was not a question so much as a story that really affected me when I first heard it in just how fucked up it was. I really only wanted an excuse to tell it again. Thanks, Big. Okay, Rich, that's, that's really weird. Uh, the grandstanding mostly was what was weird. <laughs> I'm gonna hang up on you. I'll, I'll answer your question um, here on camera. And uh, was it a question? Um, but yeah, that's, that's a little bit of what uh, life is like. Uh, you don't know what you got till it's gone. I, I believe it was uh, the band Cinderella that taught me that. Um, and when it comes down to it, there's... <sighs> Being able to raise a child, it's something really special. And... Uh, Yeah, it's it's really tough to let him go. But like I was just saying, you know, that, that's the whole point. It's really hard when you get to that point that you... And it sounds to me like this woman telling the story was just talking about them going off to kindergarten, not going off to friggin' uh, UCLA or something. But, yeah, it's, it's really tough. Um... And uh, I would say that even if I were to achieve all the dreams that I had, uh, you know, I wrote novels and was successful and, and did all the things that I wanted to do, if all my kids turned out to be monsters, uh, I would feel like I hadn't achieved anything. I would feel like my, my life was a waste. Um, because yeah, seriously, uh, people are what matters the most in this world. People are most important. And especially those people that, you know, you are in charge of this. That was my child. I created him. I brought him into the world. And I'm really glad that... He's turned out as good as he has. I hope uh, he will continue to be worthwhile and will continue to do things that are good and he'll continue to be happy. And I guess that's all I can, all I can hope for. Um, as you can see, I've made it to work. I just kind of pulled over before pulling into the parking lot to finish the show. So I guess I'm going to have to call it a show now and put an end to it. Thanks for listening, everybody, to this view into my soul. This far too intimate connection <laughs> with all of y'all out there. Uh, next time I'll do something a little lighter. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about something, you know, something along my normal nerdy lines and uh, and this can be put behind us but anyways thanks for listening everybody and uh, i will see you next time
Congratulations. Today is your day. You're off to a great place. You're off and away. Your goal should be a dream with a deadline. That's why I gave you five years. Do it! Do it! You miss 100% of the shots you never take. Take the shot. There will always be things in the way you dream. Don't let your dreams be dreams. You go out and you find why not. You surround yourself with why not. Live a why not life, man. Where we are today is where we are. Today's the starting day. I know what we're gonna do today. Just do it! Do it! And will you succeed? Yes, you will indeed. 98 and three quarters percent guaranteed. That's all it takes to be successful is an attitude. It's an awesome feeling when you truly believe that you're going to be successful. Nothing is impossible! Dreams don't come true. Dreams are made true. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. Bye bye, boy! Have fun storming the castle! Think it'll work? It would take a miracle. Bye bye! Bye!